yes welcome back so we are now looking at the trial of jesus before pontius pilate the governor of judea um in john chapter 18 if we were to look at uh, verse 28 uh, this is what it says it says then they took jesus from caiaphas to pilate's headquarters it was early in the morning they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Uh, so uh, the religious leaders now bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate and uh, Jesus is taken by soldiers into the headquarters but the religious leaders themselves do not enter into the headquarters because if they enter into a uh, pagan premises it would lead to um to uh, ritual uh, you know uh, ritual contamination they, uh, they would have to again purify themselves so therefore they don't enter into the pagan headquarters of the romans um, only Jesus enters inside and Pilate comes outside and he talks to the leaders and he says to them, um, if um, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Because Pontius Pilate uh, was not interested in spiritual matters and uh, um, so he believes that these people have brought him, uh, brought Jesus over here due to some uh, loopholes in the Jewish law, which they are upset about. And so he is not concerned regarding those matters. And so he says to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. But then the leaders, they reply and they say, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. A death sentence could only be given by the uh, Roman governor and so they are basically saying we have come over here for a death sentence and only you can issue that therefore you have to undertake this trial now uh, as far as Rome was concerned uh, they were not interested in the religious practices of the people that they had conquered all they wanted is to maintain peace so that they can continue holding on to their power and uh, so the main thing, the main responsibility of Pontius Pilate was to maintain political stability in that entire region, which is why he asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus uses this opportunity to reveal himself uh, to this man, you know, in the hope that maybe Pontius Pilate will be willing to place his faith and trust in Jesus. So that's basically how the conversation comes to this point. Um, Pilate asked him, it, this would be in verse 37, Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? Okay, so here Jesus is clearly giving Pilate an opportunity and saying, you know, I have come as a king and I am testifying to the truth and everyone who is willing to believe in this truth, you know, they will listen to my voice. But Pilate, he turns down the opportunity being given to him and he just mockingly says what is truth you know in in other words he's saying oh truth is relative you're saying this is truth we on the other hand say that something else is truth truth can be anything you know what is truth and he just kind of dismisses uh, what jesus is offering and then he goes out to the religious leaders once again you know he goes out from inside the headquarters uh, to outside where the religious leaders are waiting and he says to them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you as at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And then the uh, they reply and they say, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. So um, 
why do the religious leaders choose Barabbas rather than Jesus? That's because um, this Barabbas was a kind of, uh, you know, political uh, revolutionary. So they are hoping that he will um, at least be able to benefit them in some way in gaining a little more political power. And so they choose Barabbas over Jesus. And uh, so with this being the background, now we move into chapter 19. All right. If we can have someone read out for us, chapter 19, verses 1 to 11. Yes. Chapter 19, verses 1 to 11. Maybe we can first read out chapter, verses 1 to 7. Yeah. Uh, chapter 19, verses 1 to 7, please. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure whether anyone is present or not because you know no one switches on the cameras. So if anyone is present, um, if you could please read for us John 19 verses 1 to 7. John 19, 1 to 7. Yes. Can, can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, go ahead. Hello. Yeah. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the sol soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they stuck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him not out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And the pilot said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, we he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. All right. So here we see that uh, the that the religious leaders they say that they would prefer to have Barabbas released rather than Jesus. So uh, once they decide that they do not want Jesus to be released. Pilate has no choice, so his idea is to, you know, flog Jesus um, uh, and to bring some kind of punishment upon him, which will satisfy the uh, the Jewish leaders, and then to release him. So that is why he has Jesus, you know, dressed in that purple robe, uh, so that he's mocked, he's humiliated, he's beaten, and. Uh, uh, his hope is that whatever punishment you know he's meeting out upon Jesus, that will be considered satisfactory by the Jews. So he basically does that, and then he brings um, Jesus out to the religious leaders. But they are not satisfied with whatever um, you know whatever torture has been has been inflicted upon Jesus. They still want the crucifixion to be done. So. Uh, why is Pilate hesitating so much? Why doesn't he just go ahead and crucify Jesus? Um, he says, Pilate says in verse 6, he says, Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. There are laws and procedures which Pilate had to follow as the Roman governor. He could not just randomly take whatever decision he wanted uh, because he is supposed to maintain political stability in that place. You know, if he begins to issue um, death sentences to whomever he wants to, uh, that would lead to political instability. And for the Roman emperors, the most important thing was to maintain full control over the regions uh, which, you know, which they had. And uh, so they had issued strict laws that only in case of a political threat, 
if somebody is trying to come up and you know in a, come up and uh, place themselves as independent ruler only then uh, it, it should serious action be taken only in such cases uh, where there is uh, serious murders or crime uh, a death sentence should be imposed so there are certain rules which they had imposed and uh, pilate was trying to abide by those rules um, when he spoke to jesus and jesus said i'm my you know my kingdom is not of this world uh, pilate loses interest because he feels okay if, if, if jesus kingdom is not of this world then it has got nothing to uh, not, nothing to do with the roman empire it will not uh, threaten the roman empire in any way and so he does not feel any desire to um, to kill or crucify jesus you know so he backs off uh, because there is no political threat involved um, in the same way when it comes to crucifixion he is not willing to do that because he does not find any serious crime being done because tomorrow uh, the roman uh, authorities from rome will question him and ask him why did you impose a death sentence and if he does not have a solid excuse uh, he would be beheaded so that's, that's the seriousness uh, that is why pilate is very very reluctant and then the religious leaders they say we have a law and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of god okay so up to now pilate did not have a very clear picture of why the religious leaders wanted jesus to be killed and now they say the reason that we want him to be killed is because he is claiming to be the messiah he is claiming to be the son of god um, actually in reality according to the jewish law which they were practicing at that time there is really no death sentence for anyone claiming messiahhood so actually they are lying over here in this particular case uh, and they lie and they say according to our law anyone who's claiming to be the son of god should be put to death is the lie which they say and now when pilate hears this now for the first time he really you know takes an interest in this entire case in verse 8 we are told now when pilate heard this he was more afraid than ever so now for the first time you know this entire case has caught pilate's attention from here on we see him making a genuine effort to do something about this whole issue uh, so if we can have someone read out for us john chapter 19 we are looking at verses 8 to 12 verses 8 to 12 please Eight to twelve. Therefore, when Pilate heard that say, that saying, he was the more afraid, afraid, and went again into the uh, plan, platorium and said to Jesus, "Where are you from?" But just but Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, "Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you?" Jesus answered. you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin from then on pilate sought to release him but the jews cried out saying if you let this man go you are not caesar's friend whoever makes himself a king speaks against caesar okay so now Uh, earlier jesus said to pilate my kingdom is not from this place it is from somewhere else and at that time pilate had not paid much much attention to what jesus was saying but now uh, when he hears that jesus is claiming to be the son of god he begins to wonder is this a divine being who is you know uh, being um, uh, brought over here so now he is afraid and so he again goes to jesus in verse 9 you know he goes back inside the headquarters that word which is being used over there in the nkjv praetorium that just basically the um, the roman word for 
the Roman headquarters. Okay, so he, Jesus, uh, so so Pilate goes back inside and he asks Jesus once again, "Where are you from?" Because earlier Jesus said, "My kingdom is from another place." And so now Pilate wants to know: Is he talking about a heavenly kingdom? So which is why uh, he goes back to Jesus and he asks, "Where are you from?" But Jesus gave him no answer because earlier when Jesus gave an answer, what did uh, Pilate do? He dismissed what Jesus said. He said, "What is the truth?" You know. So at that time, very plainly, Jesus told him the truth. Jesus said, "I'm from another place, and I am a king, and I have come to testify." And what I am saying is truth, and if, and those who be, believe in this truth, they belong to me. And after that clear explanation which Jesus gave, what is Pilate's response? He just dismissed Jesus and he said, "Oh, what is the truth?" So now Jesus does not reply to him when he asks the second time, "Where are you from?" And then Pilate says to him, "Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? So why are you being quiet? I am a very powerful person. I can actually harm you." And then Jesus says to him, "You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above." So indirectly, Jesus is saying, "I am from above, and the power which I hold is from above. So you, with your earthly power, can really do no harm to me." And uh, so then Jesus says, "Therefore, the one who handed me over to you." Is guilty of a greater sin because these religious leaders they were aware of where he is from, that he is from above, and in spite of that they have brought him over here. And after Jesus speaks these words, now Pilate is genuinely afraid, and in verse twelve it says, "From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out and they said, 'If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor.'" So now they are threatening him. So now, Pilate is actually experiencing spiritual fear. He is afraid that if he does this, he is going to actually bring down the anger of a powerful god upon his head. He is genuinely uh, now experiencing spiritual fear, and that is why he wants to release Jesus. But Now the Jews they say to him, "If you release him, then you are not a friend of the emperor." Um, everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor, and this is something which Pilate was very much aware of. Um, in the time of Herod the Great, um, Herod the Great asks the Roman emperor uh, to give him the title of king, you know, because otherwise Herod the Great was just supposed to be a kind of uh, Official, you know, a government-appointed official. But um, Herod the Great uh, requests Emperor Augustus uh, to give him the title of king, and that is how he becomes King Herod. Okay, so uh, after he dies, his son, um, um, his son's name is. Um, um, his Can't particularly remember. I've written it down here somewhere. Herod Antipas, yeah, Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. So when Herod Antipas comes to the throne, uh, now the emperor has changed. Uh, emperor Augustus is no longer uh, the Roman emperor. Uh, he is succeeded by Emperor Tiberius. So Herod Antipas. He again makes a request to this new emperor, Emperor Tiberius, saying, "In the same way, my father was given the royal title of king. Can I also have the royal title?" But Tiberius is a highly paranoid uh, emperor. You know, he does not want anyone else to have the you know title of king. He wants to hold on to power um, all by himself. So he takes a very very strict. Stand against anyone who you know asks for requests like this. So, in fact, when Herod Antipas makes this request, uh, he throws him from his uh, kingship. Uh, uh, Herod Antipas actually loses his position. So, during the time of Tiberius, Herod Antipas does not have the title of king. He is simply known as Herod the 
tetrarch that word tetrarch means ruler of one fourth you know ruler ru ruler of one fourth is not very important not the same as king so um throughout the time of jesus this herod the um, antipas is only known as herod the tetrarch is never known as herod the king and later when he asks for that kingship tiberius in fact you know throws him uh, from his um, position and so um, right now tiberius is the one who is in power and so when these people the religious leaders when they say anyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor they are basically saying pilate if you don't um crucify this jesus it's like as if you are supporting this jesus and you're supporting his kingship against the kingship of tiberius what will happen to you you know if you if you call yourself a friend of this king and so when they bring up this argument then pilate who is more interested in in political power rather than in his spiritual future and destiny he decides that all right you know i will i will give up this jesus and uh, so when it says in verse 13 when pilot heard these words he brought jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone pavement and so over there he finally makes the decision that he will allow jesus to be crucified um so in fact one last time in verse 15 he asks he says pilate asked them shall i crucify your king the chief priest answered we have no king but the emperor so now there is no choice you know they they are again insisting that their emperor is tiberius so then it says then he handed him over to them to be crucified so here in these verses we see a battle being waged for the soul of a pagan Jesus makes this offering to this very corrupt uh, politically hungry leader he gives even that man a chance to accept the truth but pilate in his greed for temporary power gives up his eternal destiny okay so pilate loses out and so finally jesus is given the uh, you know the order for crucifixion and so they take jesus away uh, carrying the cross jesus goes over there carrying the cross by himself all right um if we could maybe have someone read out for us from verse 17 to 22 yeah john 19 17 to 22 if we could have someone read out please john chapter 19 was 17 to 22 22 and he uh, bearing the and he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of skull which is called in hebrew golgotha where he where they crucified him and two others with him one on either side and jesus in the center now pilot wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth the king of Jews then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in hebrew greek and latin therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to the pilot do not write the king of Jews but he said i am the king of the Jews pilot answered what i have written i have written then the soldiers when they had crucified jesus took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part and also the tunic now the tunic was without seam woven mm -hmm. from the top in one piece they said therefore among themselves let us not tear it but cast lots for it whose it shall be and the scriptures might be fulfilled which says they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots they all right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, that that should be enough for now yeah so we see over here uh, that the inscription which pilate puts on the cross uh, he writes over there 
um, the king of the Jews. Because tomorrow, you know, when, when uh, Tiberius and the authorities in Rome, if they question him and ask, why did you give a death sentence, then at least he'll be able to say, this person claimed to be the king of the Jews. Okay, so um, the leaders, on the other hand, are very upset that Jesus is, has openly been declared as king. And so they say, why don't you instead write that he claims to be king is not actually the king. But Pilate says, what I have written, I have written, and I will not change it. So Pilate was basically trying to save his political career. He wanted to have a legal reason for the death sentence which he has issued. And so he puts over there, puts the title over there as king of the Jews. And in so in a way, he plays a part in declaring the truth the reality because Jesus indeed was the king of the Jews. All right. So we see that. And then uh, one of the um, one by one, all the prophecies which were made about Jesus get fulfilled. So there's this prophecy about how the clothing will not be, how his clothing will be, divi will be divided among them. And so we see that um, they cast lots for his garment. And that particular, um, that particular prophecy is fulfilled. OK, so um, moving on from there, uh, if we can maybe look at verses 28 to 30. Yeah, if someone could read out for us verses 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now, now a vessel full. I can't hear you. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear oh. me now? Yes, yeah, I know I can hear you. Go ahead. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they and they then they took a sponge with sour wine and on it a hyssop and put it on his mouth. So when Jesus had received received the sour wine he said it is finished and lift and bowing his head he gave up his spirit all right so we see over here uh, that after everything has been fulfilled then he asks for uh, that uh, wine vinegar up to that point you know he refuses to drink any of the wine vinegar which is given to him because that will have a kind of numbing effect on his senses he will not be able to think clearly so he does not want his mind to be clouded so earlier when they offer him a drink he refuses it he does not take it but now after having completed all the work that he's supposed to do on the cross now he is he now he willingly accepts the wine vinegar which is you know attached to a sponge and given to him and he he sucks uh, sucks that uh, sponge and you know he uh, he's able to wet his lips with that and then after having had this drink then jesus speaks that greek word it's one single word which is there in the you know in the greek bible the word which jesus speaks it is tetelestai and that word tetelestai basically means it is finished so Jesus says that one word, it is finished, and then he bows his head and he gives up his spirit. So it says very clearly over here in this verse 30, with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Nobody took his spirit from him. He chose to give it up. He chose the exact moment when he will release his spirit. So all along throughout the entire crucifixion ordeal he was completely in charge nothing could be done to him without his permission only what he permitted could you know uh, could be unleashed upon him so now still exercising full authority he determines and decides the moment and time of his death uh, basically when it comes to the crucifixion uh, in in those days the most of the people who were crucified would hang on the cross for multiple days because it is a very slow form of death. It would take around two or three days for a person to die. You know, So um, after they would hang over there for two to three days, 
then finally they would die and then they would take the the dead body and throw it in a common grave or they would just simply discard it uh, outside the city you know where the wild animals would eat it that is basically how uh, crucifixions took place but here you know it's all carefully planned by jesus he he is come is in complete control of the entire situation and so he decides exactly when he is going to give up his spirit uh, and uh, uh, so later when they come to you know break the bones of the um, of the crucified persons at that time they don't feel the need to break his bones because he has already um, willingly given up his spirit so here we see uh, jesus speaking that word tetelestai it is finished and we uh, learn in isaiah 53 3 to 5 exactly what was finished we see that two things were finished two things were completely accomplished um, so maybe we could just dwell on that one uh, verse isaiah 53 5 Uh, which talks about exactly what was finished you know what exactly was accomplished so isaiah 53 5 if one of us could read out isaiah 53 5 but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement was of for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed so we learn over here in this verse that what has he finished what did he accomplish uh, for our transgressions for our sins he was wounded and bruised and so to establish peace between god the father and us for that for the sake of that uh, you know he was chastised and uh, and then we also see that uh because of the wounds and stripes which were uh, inflicted upon his body through that our healing was released so we learn that there are two things which have been completed on the cross first we have been made completely righteous you know now we have the same righteousness as jesus himself uh because he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities so he took our iniquities he took our transgressions which means now our status is one of complete righteousness in the next 5 minutes if a believer were to die without fail they will go to heaven why because they are not going to heaven in their own righteousness now they are clothed in the complete perfect righteousness of jesus himself because on the cross he was wounded and bruised for their transgressions and their iniquities so the status which the person now holds is one of complete righteousness the second status which the person has is one of complete healing so it's complete righteousness and complete healing uh, which has been released to every single believer however in the natural realm even though i am completely righteous i still do unrighteous deeds you know um, every now and then uh, because of my unrenewed mind because of my you know fallen flesh nature so because of that there are still times when i do unrighteous deeds even though my status is of complete righteousness so when that happens do i pretend and say to myself no 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 i have not sinned because i'm completely righteous no i admit that i have sinned i admit that i am operating at a lower level than my status and so i confess my sin and i say lord this is not the status which you gave me i am operating below my my higher status and so lord please forgive me of what i have done and through the power of the cross i will fight until i overcome this particular temptation and sin so we don't give up we don't pretend we admit that we have fallen we admit that we have sinned and we claim that through the power of the cross one day we will be able to overcome that sin we will be able to overcome that temptation so that same uh, policy which we apply to you know the righteousness the, the righteousness which we hold 
that very same principle and policy we apply also to the area of healing. We have been given complete healing in Jesus. That work has been finished. But in the natural realm, in the same way that we perform unrighteous deeds sometimes, in the same way our physical body is attacked by sickness and disease. And so when that happens, we don't pretend that we are not sick. We admit that we are operating at a lower level than the status which was given to us. And so we say, Lord, even though this higher status of complete healing has been given to me, right now I'm operating at a lower level and these viruses have you know, impacted my body and brought fever into my body. But by the power of Jesus, the work which was done on the cross, through the power of the work of the cross, I command these viruses you know, to leave in the name of Jesus. So using the power of the cross, I overcome the sickness. So the perfect righteousness and the perfect healing were accomplished. But in the natural realm, sometimes we operate at a lower level than the higher than the high status which has been given to us. When we operate in the at a lower level, we take the power of the cross and we use that power to overcome this lower level of functioning, you know, so that we can gain victory and have what we were meant to have in Christ. So uh, this is the privilege which has been given to us regarding our righteousness and this is the privilege which has been given to us regarding healing. So we claim that because of what Jesus has done. And uh, moving on from there, um, if we can maybe look at verses 31 to 37. Yeah, this is basically the passage where it talks about how uh, because Jesus had already given up his spirit willingly at the moment that he chose, he, you know, his bones did not need to be uh, broken. Um, maybe we can look at verses 31 to 34. If someone could read out verses 31 to 34. Verse 31. Therefore, because it was a preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the leg of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So the reason that they wanted the crucified uh, you know, criminals to be killed on the same day is because now there is a special Sabbath which has come up. What is a special Sabbath? You know, Sabbath is basically or every seventh day. Every Saturday was supposed to be a Sabbath day for the Jews. But some days, the feast day also would coincide with the Sabbath day. So on this particular Sabbath, not only are they ha are they having uh, a Sabbath day, they are all, it's also the day of the Passover. Both the days fell on the same day. So it became a special Sabbath because on that Sabbath day, you also have a feast taking place. One of the feasts, you know, which had been uh, uh, prescribed in Leviticus. So therefore, it is a special Sabbath. And on that day, they do, they do not want uh, uh, unclean, you know, dying people to be hanging on a cross because a cross is a cursed thing. It's an unclean thing. So they wanted the uh, the uh, the criminals to be removed from the cross so that the special Sabbath can be honored. So with that in mind, they ask that the legs of the criminals be broken so that you know they will die faster. Otherwise, they would the death would take two to three days and. With, because of that, the soldiers, they come and they break the legs of the other two thieves. But when they come to Jesus, they see that he has already uh, given up his spirit voluntarily. You know, and so there is no need for them to break his legs. And then it goes on to tell us in verses 36 and 37, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. 
and as another scripture says they will look on the one they have pierced uh, let's look at these two references you know which are which these two prophecies which are being fulfilled uh, the first prophecy um, is um, found in psalm 34 19 to 20 psalm 34 19 to 20 if someone could read out Nineteen. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. If you look at this prophecy, the emphasis is over here on Jesus' righteousness. The righteous person, you know, the Lord delivers him from them from all his troubles. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. And then there's another prophecy which talks about uh, you know the bones not being broken. That would be Exodus 12, 46. Yeah, so if you could read out Exodus 12, 46. Exodus 12, 46. Yeah. In in one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. Over here, the emphasis is on the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. So there are two aspects which are being fulfilled you no, know, in Jesus' bones not being broken. The first is that he is righteous, completely righteous, and the and it says so the Lord will protect the bones of the righteous one so that they will not be broken. The other aspect of the you know uh, unbroken bones is the uh, passage in Exodus 12 46 where the Passover lamb its bones were never broken. So in the same way even Jesus uh, the Passover lamb when he becomes the Passover lamb his bones are also not broken. So in uh, both aspects of this um, you know, of this prophecy are fulfilled in Jesus. And then uh, moving into the last portion, uh, that would be verses 38 to 42. So yes, if you could have someone read out that last portion for us, 38 to 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fearing of the Jew, fear of the Jews, asked the pilot that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of mire and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So we see two important um, uh, you know, uh, officials uh, who are now willing to uh, publicly acknowledge their, that they are followers of Jesus. One is Joseph of Arimathea. We are told about him in verse 38 that he, that he had been a secret disciple so far because he was afraid of the Jewish leaders. But now, you know, he's no longer afraid of the Jewish leaders. He publicly comes forward and admits that he is a follower of Jesus. And then we also have Nicodemus who had earlier visited at night time. But now, in daytime, in front of everyone, he is admitting and acknowledging that he is a follower of Jesus. The beauty of these two people, you know, acknowledging Jesus at this point uh, shows, you know, we, we, we see it in the fact that now, as far as they know, Jesus is gone. You know, they, do, they don't really believe that he's going to be resurrected. They're not really aware of these facts yet. And so, uh, from their perspective, as far as they know, Jesus is gone. 
so now actually there's no need for them to come out in public and even admit their loyalty but it shows how much they love the lord that you know what has been done to the lord is so heartbreaking for them that even though they have lost everything they are willing to come and take a public stand for him you know they they're not believe they they, they they as far as they know he is no longer there as far as they know, they know they are not going to gain any benefit from acknowledging him now so they purely acknowledge him out of a sense of loyalty and love so these two persons who were earlier afraid to acknowledge their loyalty now after believing that he is completely gone and they're not going to get any benefit out of him it's just out of sheer pure love that they choose to come and take a stand for him and honor him by you know uh, applying all of those um uh, all of those um, spices which they which was part of their custom so they come and they apply those spices uh, to the body of jesus uh, and perform all of those burial rituals and then in verse 41 we are told Uh, that Jesus is laid in a tomb in which no one had ever been laid and this is a very important point uh, because in those days um a, a a tomb was basically not a constructed building it it usually used to be a cave you know a cave would be uh, regarded as a family tomb so inside that cave they would carve out uh, many shelves you would have large shelves and you would have small shelves so in the large shelves they would place the bodies of all the family members of that particular uh, you know uh, family because the tomb would be a family tomb so for generations the bodies of different members of the family would be placed in the different shelves which they have carved out once the once the body becomes completely dried up you know and all the uh, flesh completely shrivels up then they would um, you know once it's reduced to you know dust and bones then they would gather the bones and they would put it in a stone jar and then they would place it on a smaller shelf to create space for you know future generations so that more generations can be buried that's basically how uh, uh, family tombs functioned the thing about this particular tomb is that nobody has ever been laid inside only one single body was ever placed inside this tomb and that one body disappeared you know and so there were no other bodies left once this particular body you know got resurrected and and went away there were no other bodies left what if they had chosen a tomb which had other bodies because you see then people would point to one of the corpses and say oh that must be the uh, body of jesus so it's very significant that a tomb was chosen a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid that was chosen because now nobody can point to one of the other bodies in the tomb and say ah see that is the body of jesus so over here in this tomb only jesus was ever buried and so once he got resurrected it was clear proof that the resurrection has taken place they cannot point to any body and say that is jesus or this is jesus you know so that is how uh, god planned for a tomb to be chosen in which nobody had ever been laid uh, so yeah these are just some of the things that we could uh, cover in today's portion let's just close with a word of prayer Lord we thank you for some of the things that we could learn from your word today we thank you oh lord uh, for the example prayer the, uh, which you have set uh, for us uh, and lord we learned that there are four main things that we should focus on even in our own prayers and we pray oh lord that you would help us to do that and lord we pray that we would uh, not be like pontius pilot who focused on temporary benefits and temporary privileges and gave up eternal destiny in the process we pray that we would not be like that but we would keep our eyes always focused on um, eternal results and eternal rewards and lord we pray that we will be like these two men uh, joseph and nicodemus who even though they would they thought that there, there is no personal benefit to be gained they came forward a lot to express their love and loyalty 
to you. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we would have that same level of love and loyalty towards you as these men. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.